from the Ion Prostate State Center office. She's a registered nurse and has been in the oncology field since 2011. She joined the team at Ion Prostate State Center a year ago as a resource nurse, where she supports men along their prostate cancer journey. This last year has seen many changes to Connie's practice as she has been focusing on sexual rehabilitation course with PCIT to further understand the impact of this disease and how it affects all aspects of men's health. Men's health. Connie never managed she would be in this type of nursing role, but is really excited to be part of the growing sexual health and rehabilitation services offered in British Columbia. Connie has been part of the rollout of a provincial prostate cancer supportive care program here in Victoria and has been in ed education slash facilit facil facilitation role for both the sexual rehabilitation and the ADT modules. Tonight's presentation will be a condensed version of the sexual rehabilitation talk she gives for the provincial program with all the most applicable information up for discussion. You want to take questions during or after? Anytime. Anytime. So anytime you want to question Connie, go ahead. Connie, take a second. Hold the rotten fruit until the end, okay? <laughs> <laughs> <Gary>. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Robert, uh, and thank you guys for coming up tonight. Um, as Robert mentioned, <laughs> I never in my wildest nursing <laughs> nightmares or dreams pictured I'd be standing in front of a group of people talking about sexual rehabilitation, but here we are. Um, I wanted to thank the, the group with BCIT and the Vancouver Prostate Center for being such good support uh, people along this journey, and to thank Leanne as well for her support and understanding in my uh, my learning curve of this, this topic. Um, <clears throat> it's, as uh, Robert mentioned, a condensed version of what we talk about on a monthly basis uh, in the, the provincial program. So this is my own take on it. Um, and ask, ask away. So <clears throat> just a little note on the housekeeping ideas here. Uh, again, Vegas rules apply. Uh, whatever happens here stays here. Feel free to ask questions or if you feel comfortable sharing, do so. Uh, but just, you know, keep in mind confidentiality and privacy of everyone. Uh, cell phones, if you could please silence them, that'd be great. And ask your questions as they come up. And if questions around your own health situation or medications, uh, if, it, if you're you know, thinking about some of those situations, I may not be the best one to answer them, but your doctor, your GP, or your urologist, or your radiation oncologist might be. So you can bring those back to your, your healthcare team. So tonight, we've got a few topics to cover. <clears throat> we will be talking about sex. I hope you're all aware of that. Uh, if there's anything that comes up that you're, you know, not too keen on being part of the conversation, feel free to take a little walk. Um, we'll be talking about some anatomy and the effects of prostate cancer treatments on that anatomy. Uh, we'll be talking about this idea of penile rehabilitation and some options for gaining and maintaining erections. So that's kind of the, um, the whole conversation tonight. And in the oncology world, um, sexual, the, the sexual health system is something that's often uh, not talked about. We ignore it. We, we're really good as, as nurses and other practitioners, we're really good about interrogating you about your bowel function and your bladder and your respiratory system and your cardiac system, but we're really not very good about talking about your sexual function. So, it's exciting, you know, to think about this this program and and the work that's being done in Vancouver and other work that we're starting to get off the ground here. Uh, we want to really talk about it and, and get it out there. So um, we know that people don't talk about it. We know that practitioners don't talk about it. We know that patients are waiting for their uh, their practitioners to talk about it. So often, you know, there's this feeling that there's just no time to discuss it. It's not one of the primary concerns. Um, or we just don't feel comfortable discussing it. Uh, and again, it's, you know, it can turn into this big elephant in the room. 
especially in the prostate cancer environment. We know it's, it's a concern. We know it's something that uh, is usually front, you know, front of mind, but it can wreak havoc if we don't address it. So this big elephant can really you know, make a mess of the room, make a mess of one's quality of life. So it's really, really important to start talking about it, having these conversations. Um, and some of the main sexual health concerns that come up within the prostate cancer realm are erectile dysfunction and decreased libido. And we'll talk about those um, as we go along here. But believe it or not, a lot of these changes or challenges are pretty common and um, they can be remedied and we just have to talk about it. We just have to ask those questions and um, bring it up with our healthcare team as they come up. So we'll jump right into some anatomy here, a photo or a diagram a lot of you guys are probably pretty familiar with. Um, we're looking at this prostate gland right here. Uh, and connected to it is the seminal vesicle. And those are two key players in sexual function. Um, we'll, we'll look at prostatectomy, which is the surgical removal and radiation therapy and how, how those areas are affected. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> we're also going to look at some nerves. So we all hear about, you know, nerve sparing procedures and the nerves that are connected to the prostate. And um, they're a very delicate web of nerves that, that sit there. And their function is one element um, of what helps control erections. So any of you who may have been considering surgery or have had it and you've heard these terms of uh, full nerve sparing or partial nerve sparing, we're talking about those nerves that sit around the prostate. They're also connected to the nerve network that uh, control erections. Uh, they're really delicate and with these treatments can be easily damaged. So they're pretty, they're pretty important and they are key players. So where do erections come from? Uh, we need a few, a few things uh, for a healthy, for healthy erectile tissue, um, and you know, good blood flow is one of the primary uh, pieces of the puzzle, as well as those nerves to be intact and able to, um, to fire. Uh, the, the body's really smart, and it it has often has a backup plan for a lot of different systems. So, you know, if those nerves aren't cooperating, there's always, um, you know, blood flow to be, to be um, maximized. So, if those nerves are damaged, it's not the end of the road. There's always a plan B. Um, <clears throat> so, in, in the penis, there are basically three tubes. Um, we've got these corpora cavernosa. Those are the two erectile bodies and the urethra right below it. So those two erectile bodies, they're filled basically with this spongy tissue. It's the way I, I envision it. Um, they're called sinusoids. And they're basically just sinuses um, that are available for blood flow. So when smooth muscle relaxes, the blood flows in. And that is what creates an erection. Uh, so the elements necessary for an erection are <coughs> blood flow, nerves, <coughs> and tissue, uh, an adequate blood supply to actually, you know, have an effect here. So, you know, we talk about exercise and how important that is, and and you know, we talk about medications and how they can play a part. So those are all things we need to think of here. Um, <coughs> Sexual, arous sexual arousal stimulates the release of neurotransmitters like testosterone. So, you know, it comes into play here and it, it, um, those nerves basically use testosterone to signal for that smooth muscle to relax and for the blood to flow in. So that's kind of the, the concept there. Testosterone and nerves work together to relax that tissue and, you know, move a, a flaccid penis to the erect state by drawing blood in. Um, <clears throat> there's also something right at the base of the penis called the, uh, the tunica, and it basically just kind of tightens up 
when the blood flows in and allows that blood to stay and not be turned back to the body. So um, it's, you know, it's elastic tissue and also very important in this whole process too. It has to be healthy. So these are some concepts that we'll, we'll kind of look at further on. But we'll talk about treatments first and how those can uh, affect the situation. So we all know about active surveillance. That's not having any, that's having a prostate cancer diagnosis but not uh, taking any, any treatment uh, necessarily. So there's no, no radiation, no surgery, but it's, it's more just monitoring PSA, making sure things are you know, starting to progress. The prostatectomy is the surgical removal of the prostate. And then we've got the radiation, the external beam and the brachytherapy, and the hormone therapy, everyone's favorite. So they all <coughs> can have sexual implications. Um, we won't talk too much tonight about the active surveillance as it, it does have implications, you know, with any um, anxiety about progression, there's always worry that things, you know, things could change and that could affect one's libido and, and just, you know, overall anxiety levels. But we'll, we'll speak mainly to the, the four, uh, the prostatectomy, the radiation, and the hormone therapy. And, you know, when, when thinking of uh, best case scenario with any of these treatments, the first goal is always to eliminate the prostate cancer. Get rid of it. Whichever you know, whichever modality one would choose, get rid of that. So you don't have to worry about it. The second one that um, you know, as, as far as order of operations, incontinence can be a real issue, and um, it can it can be short lived or it can be something that um, one would deal with for a long time. So it's hard to move past that and. You know, think about what sexual function if you're still dealing with the incontinence. So, um, once that can be under control, whether that's you know doing all the kegels and the pelvic floor rehab, or potentially surgery, then you know considering what sexual function can be can be addressed. So, with that prostatectomy, um, it's uh, an acute phase of rehabilitation basically uh, it's that surgical removal and full recovery can take you know 8 to 12 weeks maybe longer for some maybe not as long for some and this whole concept of pelvic floor rehab before the surgery and after it's really important pelvic floor rehab will be really essential for controlling any any urinary continence um, but it's also really helpful in um, strengthening those pelvic muscles and that also aids in erectile function. So pelvic floor rehab is a good thing uh, and it's something we should all be doing all the time. Uh, so do your kegels. With, um, <clears throat> with the prostatectomy, erectile changes are usually immediate and those, uh, that bundle of nerves that sits around the prostate and kind of underneath the prostate, they can go into shock. So with any damage or any manipulation to the prostate, those those nerves can just say, nope, not, not gonna work. I'm taking a holiday for a little while. And that holiday can last up to four years. So I've, I've had conversations with men, you know, 10 days after a prostatectomy, and things are working pretty well for them. But I've also, um, been in contact with fellas who were, you know, five years out, and you know, they're still working on on their rehab plan. So, it's it's so uh, it's different for every fella. And the first, um, as we mentioned, the first objective is to get rid of that cancer. Sometimes, if it goes outside that prostate, uh, the nerves have to be taken with it. So that that can lead to a partial nerve sparing or potentially non-nerve sparing procedure. And that does have impact. Because um, then we're, you know, when we're thinking about what what helps with erectile function, we know it's those nerves as well as blood flow. So if you eliminate, you know, a key player there, we're just looking at, you know, blood flow now at this point. And and how do we how do we come up with a plan on that? Uh, there can be some ejaculation and orgasmic changes. And according to Christine from Vancouver, um, 
There's about 40% of men who say it's changed but still enjoyable. 40% uh, who say it's about the same, and actually 20% who say orgasm is better after prostatectomy. So um, again, you know, there could be this post-operative phase for a couple weeks after where there's just, you know, things are uncomfortable. Things just do not feel great, and maybe it's your body just saying, well, I'm not ready yet. Just, you know, leave me alone. Um, but again, with rehab and, and with learning your body and, and you know, with, with time, things could potentially um, be maybe better than they were before. But um, those changes, as I mentioned, they may be short-lived, so they might be, you know, that, that post-operative phase of, of eight weeks or so. They could be long-term, and really your body has the last say. Uh, but what we know now is that having a plan in place, even pre-operatively, is so essential. So um, there used to be this thought that no, we'll just we'll just kind of wait and see, um, see how you know, see what kind of function you regain afterwards. We know now that we need to be a little bit more aggressive than that. So um, changes are, are happening in the urology lab. <coughs> and again, um, just one note here is that um, orgasm and erection are controlled. On different nerve nerve pathways, so you don't need erection to have orgasm. They're completely separate. So again, a little a little bonus there. And so those erectile nerves, very delicate. Um, as I mentioned, they um, they're in charge of taking that that testosterone. That might be available and and using it to relax the smooth muscle. Um, they're easily shocked, easily damaged, and even the best nerve sparing procedure does not guarantee a full recovery. Um, but again, you know your body has the final say, and with a really aggressive uh, rehab program, potentially you know you can get close to where you were preoperatively. Um, if there were if there were uh, erectile difficulties before surgery, you know that won't necessarily go away. But we can uh, work to maximize your full potential after surgery. And so with radiation, um, so with with that surgery, I mentioned there's the acute phase. With radiation, it's more of a delayed response. So. Uh, Changes may not be noticed for you know that time during treatment or even a year or so after, but it could be you know a year, two years later that that changes could occur, and it's that same concept that those nerves are really they're really delicate, and if they've been hit by by these beams or if there's brachytherapy in the mix as well, that can have a long term effect there with the, with the nerves. There's also inflammation and irritation to consider as well, and those can really uh, affect those nerves. And with radiation, bowel changes can be a reality uh, for the last couple of weeks of uh, radiation treatment, especially the external beam, and that doesn't really lead to a very sexy scenario, so um, that can kind of put a damper on things. And this idea of penile atrophy is, um, you know, it's around the concept that if, if you don't use it, you lose it. And if you're not feeling well and you're, you know, your energy's low and your libido is knocked out because you're on hormone therapy as well as radiation, and you're not engaging in, in sex uh, very often, or you know, uh, massage or, or anything to get the blood moving, then there will be some, some anatomical changes there. Uh, likely reversible again with a with a, an aggressive plan. And everyone's favorite, the hormone therapy. Um, so we know I mentioned the the use of testosterone for those nerves. Um, when the testosterone is not available because of the hormone therapy, libido um, just takes a nosedive. Uh, 
uh, and penile atrophy can happen as well from that loss of testosterone, which allows blood, uh, allows relaxation of the tissues. Um, and there is this, this hangover period uh, of hormone therapy where depending how, you know, if you're on it for six months, it'll be another six months until it's out of your system. So during that time, um, libido may be just knocked right out. And it might take a little while for testosterone to get back up to its, its, normal, uh, its normal level. And with the, with the low testosterone, uh, gaining and maintaining erections is, is tough, but also um, reaching an orgasmic threshold is tough as well. So it might take a little, uh, take a little bit longer um, <clears throat> and a little bit more work to get there. And a note with that libido, um, a lot of, there's, there's been a lot of uh, research around that. And there's an analogy that came up, and I, it, again, it's one of Christine's analogies in Vancouver, and she kind of relates it to to food. And you know, maybe maybe you're not hungry, and you know, your your partner sets up this great dinner, this huge spread, and you're looking at it, and you're not really hungry. You want to eat it, but you don't, and you don't want to insult your partner. And you know, you sit down and. And you start eating it, and all of a sudden you realize, like, wow, this is really good. I really like this. I'm hungry. And it's, it's kind of that same concept with, with libido, that maybe it's, you know, not normal for you. Maybe it's, your libido is quite a bit lower than, than you typically experience. But maybe once, once you get into the mood and into the situation, you might actually realize, like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm into this. So, you know... We'll, we'll talk about that in the in the rehab um, part of this conversation, but um, the libido can take a nosedive, and and being aware of that I think is the first step, and, and challenging yourself to to um, you know bring that libido up a little bit uh, could be a good thing. So this penile rehab idea, um, it is a, a physiotherapy program for the penis. And the reason uh, it's, it's kind of a hot topic right now is because we know with, um, with a lot of therapies, those, you know, those nerves are in shock or the testosterone is low, so things aren't working the way they normally do. And you know, uh, before, before prostate cancer diagnosis, before any health concerns came up, most men um, will have about three erections per night spontaneously. They maybe don't even realize it. It's just their bodies saying, you know, through the night. Th their bodies are just basically keeping that tissue healthy. So it's, you know, that tissue's relaxing, blood is flowing in, erections are occurring, and you're sleeping, so you don't even know it. When, uh, when a therapy happens, that, that system might be knocked right out. So the, the idea behind penile rehab is to um, create at least three erections per week to kind of um, mimic that that system that has been knocked out. So again that note about you know making a plan when you know before surgery or before radiation or wherever wherever you might be you know if it's something that's important to you it might be something that you want to plan for. Um, Talk to your urologist about it. See what options there are for you. Come into the office, and we can set up a plan. Um, we'll talk about a lot of the, the products that can be used for that, for penile rehab. Um, but it's basically just you know keeping that tissue healthy, keeping the blood flow there, um, waking up those nerves uh, if if they've been you know affected. Uh, there are tons of options. So be proactive about it. Some, some factors that do influence this recovery, we know, you know, as age increases, testosterone drops. So that's, that's a really tricky scenario, especially if you build in, the, you know, some kind of treatment or therapy that's affecting testosterone. Um, so, you know, increased age can affect that recovery. Comorbidities such as high blood pressure, um, diabetes, uh, anxiety can really affect recovery as well. And any medications, 
the, the two big ones that stick out are antidepressants, as they can decrease libido, and antihypertensives. Those are medications to control blood pressure. So if, you're, you know, if your blood pressure is low, we know that the um, sufficient amount of blood to the pelvic region may not, may not be there. So that can affect uh, one's recovery as well. And you can always, you know, if you are on a blood pressure medication, you can always go see your doctor and say, hey, you know, is this a medication that I need to be on? Um, could it be affecting my, um, my erectile function? Could we look at other options? So it's, it's something we can play around with a little bit. Um, I was just made aware a couple, probably two weeks ago, that we're getting a new uh, sex med physician in town. And I'm hoping that she might be able to address some of these concerns, with, especially with the medications. So she, she's a physician, she can prescribe. Um, it would be interesting to know if that would be something uh, that would be under her umbrella. It, it, um, there are blood pressure medications that can be less effective, for sure. Uh, smoking is a vasoconstrictor, and it also causes cancer, so don't do it. Um, and pre-treatment sexual function. As I mentioned, if there was an issue before, chances are after a treatment or after a therapy, you know, that, that issue will still be there. So um, we can, you know, maximize your function, but if, um, you know, if there was a roadblock before, we, we need to address that to move forward. So some of our options for the rehabilitation process. I've got a bunch here. Feel free to have a look at snack break. Um, we'll start with the, the least invasive and I'll, we'll move our way through the list to kind of the, um, I don't want to say last ditch effort, but the most invasive, um, which does include surgery. So we'll start out, start out gently here. So we've got the constrictor bands and I've got some of these up here with the vacuum device. Um, these basically act as that veno-occlusive mechanism. <coughs> so what they're doing is basically holding the blood in the penis. Um, they can be used alone or they can be used with the vacuum. Uh, and they can be really effective. They come in different sizes. And um, with these ones, it's pretty important to trim the hairs because that could be a little painful. Um, and also important to Keep in mind that you don't want to leave it on for longer than 30 minutes. So you might run into bigger problems if you fall asleep with it on. So set a timer. This one on the bottom here, this is a called a Vino Seal. And this is used uh, for those who may be experiencing some incontinence. And it basically just clamps the urethra. The urethra is right on the bottom. And um, it you basically just, you know, uh, put it on and, and stitch it up and it just kind of clamps the, the urethra and you know during the time it's on no urine leakage should should be occurring and then everyone's favorites uh, all the medications so these medications are effective only if those nerves are intact so these are um, um, <clears throat> they, they rely on testosterone and the cavernous nerves and they can be really effective at different stages of treatment. So if those nerves are completely asleep and they're still in that <coughs> shock phase, these might not at that point be very effective. But with time, when those nerves regain consciousness, they might, um, they might start to work for you. So in Vancouver, um, I did a, a couple days with the Vancouver team and just kind of learned what their practices were there. And because the urology group is all under one roof, they have a really um, standardized <coughs> discharge plan, I guess you could say. And so a lot of fellas who have a prostatectomy in Vancouver, they go on a daily dose of uh, Viagra or Cialis. And it's a small dose. And what it's doing is keeping those nerves kind of awake. So that's this little guy. And it's, it can be an expensive endeavor, but it, it could be just, just enough to keep those nerves firing so that you know, when, when, um, 
when one wants to have an erection, they're, they're available. Um, they do come with side effects, uh, so do read the label. If one medication doesn't work properly, you know, or it gives you <coughs> many side effects, such as back pain or a lot of sinus congestion, there are other medications to try. So be flexible with <coughs> those. Uh, with these ones, you do need sexual stimulation. You need to, you need to think sexy thoughts. You can't just, you know, pop one of the pills and read the paper and think, oh yeah, this will be great. So you do need to get in the mood for them. We've got um, both as needed medications and the daily, the low daily dose. So um, <clears throat> a lot of the as needed medications are available in your body for about four to eight hours. They're short acting. The one that's uh, a little bit different is Cialis. Again, that green box. That one is effective for about 36 hours. So you can take one and try it at different times of the day. Testosterone levels fluctuate. Um, in the morning, they're usually higher. So, you know, you can take one at night, see if it works for you. And maybe if it doesn't work at night, maybe you can see if it works in the morning because it is effective for, for 36 hours. So you've got some flexibility there. And, you know, if, if natural erections occur, maybe these medications aren't necessary at that point. Um, they can be quite expensive, and the word on the street is that a lot of urologists and a lot of GPs have a cupboard full of them. So if you're interested, ask for samples from your doctors, um, and chat with pharmacists as well. Yes. Do they work when you're on hormone therapy? Well, that's the tricky part, because hormone therapy basically knocks out the testosterone, and these ones are quite reliant on testosterone, but I have had conversations with fellows that are on these as well as the hormone therapy and they are effective. The, um, uh, the erection that could be achieved may not be as, as strong as if, if one wasn't on hormone therapy. So it's worth a try for sure. Yeah. yeah. So I guess, you know, the take home message with these ones is you do need, you know, mental arousal. Um, and challenge yourself at different stages of, of recovery with, with these medications, different times of the day, different medications, maybe different doses, and just see, see if you have any luck with them. And ask for samples. That's the other, the other key there. Are generics out yet? Generics? Are they, are they, are they as effective? Or any they would be just as effective, I would assume, because they should be the same, the same medications. Um, I don't know which ones do you have to have them, yeah. I think the Acris. Yeah. yeah, and I think Cialis is pretty close as well to having a, a generic one out. Yeah, good question. And whether they're any cheaper or not, I don't know. I think they're really <coughs> expensive. I did with, meet with the rep for Cialis, and she kind of read me the riot act about men purchasing them online, because there's a huge industry, right? Of, online um, PD5 inhibitors and there's a lot of danger around that so another take home message don't buy these online buy them at your neighborhood store so this is a medication called Muse and this um, can be really useful in the rehab process for maintaining healthy tissue it's about 80 to 90 percent or sorry, it's this one is actually about 30 to 40 percent effective. It's um, not used here very often because it is quite expensive. It's about 27 dollars per per suppository, and it comes in a gel. It comes in an injection, and it also comes in a little <laughs> pellet. And it's it's um, inserted with that little this little device into the urethra, and it just sits there and basically. Um, acts to vasodilate all the tissue in there. So it's not dependent on those nerves, it's not dependent on testosterone. Um, it's just not used here very often. So, yeah, well, the applicator is really tiny. I have seen it in person, it's tiny. But, yeah, it's probably less painful looking than the next one we'll get to, the injection. This is the vacuum device, and I've got two of them up here. 
Um, these are the medical, medically graded um, vacuums, and they're basically using negative pressure to bring in blood to the penis. They can be used with the uh, with the uh, the clamp or the uh, the ring, and these are about 80 to 90 percent effective. Um, they're really good for the rehab process in the fact that you know if you just want to keep that tissue nice and healthy and you know hit your three erections per week this can be really effective um, tissue stays well nourished well oxygenated and and healthy so you know that's really important thinking about those nerves and and you know when if those nerves wake up we want them to wake up to some healthy tissue we want that tissue to be ready to respond so this can be really 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 key in that process. The, the pump brings in about 30% arterial blood and 70% venous blood. And venous blood is darker than arterial blood, so the erection actually looks darker uh, and is a bit cooler to touch. So some people don't like that. Uh, there are ways around that, you know, jumping in the shower, using warming lubricants, that sort of thing. So it's not for everyone. It's also quite expensive. These ones are about Four hundred to five hundred dollars, I believe, but they are tax deductible. So, um, can you get those at the drugstore, or do you have to go to the tech shop? Well, a lot of the adult uh, love shops do carry similar devices, but they're not medically regulated, so they're not um, they're not you know tested maybe as rigor rigorously as far as the the pressure that they're that they're bringing in. So these ones are you know. You get a prescription for these, or what? Uh, you could, and you could use that um, as a tax write-off. There's these ones come with um, basically a, a helpline. There's a, a fellow named Lou who works with the company who provides these. And he, when you um, when this arrives at your home and you're ready to you know experiment with it, you let him know, and he calls you up, and you have apparently the guys that have had these conversations with him. He is awesome at you know instructing them how to how to use these devices because they're pretty tricky, and uh, yeah, he's really supportive. So and he makes it fun. So I know that um, he does workshops in Vancouver uh, for fellas who are wanting to try these out. He comes from the Okanagan, so I don't think he's ready to come over here, but he's available by telephone. So another good option here. And then this is the one that maybe looks a little less exciting than that uh, suppository. Although this is actually the gold standard for penile rehab and for erectile function. Uh, it's about 90% successful. And in Vancouver, they have clinics on a monthly basis for fellas who want to who wanna try this out. And I've met a lot of those guys in, in the clinics afterwards uh, in my couple days there, and they loved it. And actually, you know, I hear reports from, from local fellas uh, that I've given this talk to who also use it, who find it really effective. Um, again, this one isn't reliant on the testosterone or the nerves. So again, it's a phase of dilator. It's just allowing that tissue to relax and for the blood to come in. So really effective. It's, uh, I think it takes about five to 20 minutes to actually kick in and start working and it will last for about half an hour so I guess you know the whole idea of getting over um, sticking a needle in your penis would be the, the hardest part and then the response is really positive with this one uh, and with the dose of medication it can be titrated up or down so if you're finding you use it and you're only kind of satisfied with the response you got then the dose could be increased if you know, you start at the baseline dose and you're like, whoa, this lasts way longer than I had anticipated, the dose can be titrated down. So it can be really individualized. Um, it's, it's a really great tool to use for rehab. We've been talking about maybe um, doing some teaching around this. There's been a lot of people who have been interested in this locally. So we might start doing uh, little one-on-one -on -one sessions as far as like how to inject and you know how to handle all the, all this equipment properly. So if you're at all interested in that, we can have a conversation later. 
Um, but it is, it is something that's kind of exciting and something that the folks in Vancouver are really, um, really happy about. So is that another prescription thing? That yeah, so this one you would see a urologist for and you know, let them know you want to try the, the injections. They write you a prescription. Um, and at this time, some urologists are teaching in office, some not. Yeah. You know, like, urologists never talk about any of this stuff. Yeah. Any of this uh, rehab is just, like, this is all new to me. Yeah. And I hear this often. Yeah. Not, you know, it's not, it's not discussed. It is that elephant in the room that, you know, it's just not, not knowledge that's out there. Um, so we are, you know, in, probably in the next month, we're looking at creating a bit of a team to, you know, to set up some, some supports here as far as, you know, what, what, what area of rehab do you want to focus on? So <coughs> this will be one of them for sure. My, my urologist set me up with that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Good. He injected me in his office and didn't tell me he was going to, unfortunately. Wow. I have a button up shirt, luckily, and I can walk over. <laughs> 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 how long it lasted? How long did it last? Well, he give, they give you a Sudafed to take. He yeah. said if it lasted any more than two hours, and I kind of chuckled. He said, take two Sudafeds. Yeah. And, and he goes, if it lasts more than four, go to the emergency aisle. Oh. Oh, my God. I said, I'll phone my buddies and tell them. He said, no, I hear it's pretty painful. So anyways, two, I'm guessing about three hours in, and I was getting my truck work done by a mechanic, and I'm standing at the medium, <laughs> and I took two suits that I had them in my pocket, and nothing. nothing. I went, no, I went home, uh, about five hours, I didn't go to the hospital, about five hours in, I took two more, nothing, I, I, I melted down three ice packs, oh, it was really painful. Seven three-quarter hours and six Sudafeds. Holy Seven three-quarter hours. <laughs> yeah, that, that wasn't fun. And he didn't tell you he was injecting you? Or he didn't? Oh, he, I, I had my pants down and he, and he put the stuff in the syringe because I never used a needle and I just thought he was actually going to walk me right through to put it in and then get a, get a date and then try it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of the blue, he just jammed it in. <laughs> just, then it's a half inch needle. Oh, wow. Well, the ones but it worked. Well, they took you through it. Yeah. They took you through it. Okay. That's, wow. that's, and he was a teacher. But I just need a time. I need one unit in that syringe, and I'm good for about two hours. And I think my experience has been that the needles um, that are used are the diabetic needles, so they're teeny tiny. They're, they're not the half inch needles. Small. I sent a nurse friend of mine. A nurse friend of mine got me some of their quarter inch. Yeah, the little orange cap needles. Yeah, yeah so they're tiny. They don't even feel it. Yeah, the diameter is so small. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the starting dose is usually one, uh, one mil. One year. They're in units, and he started me off at six. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, you live to tell the tale. <laughs> well, thanks for but sharing. But it works. Yeah, it works. And that's the thing. They are really yeah. effective, sometimes too effective. But, and Sudafed is the antidote to use for, for a lot of these medications. So, yeah. Or a visit to the emergency room, unfortunately. <laughs> So that's the story of the injections. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. I think there's more stories that are that scary. Yeah. yeah. Hospital visits. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've heard I've heard some stories along the lines of the, the Viagra's and the Cialis and the same same sort of thing that you know, an erection that lasts for hours and hours and it's just not a comfortable situation to be in. Oh, it hurt. Yeah. And then it didn't. For all the men in the room, it didn't just kind of drop. It goes down this way. So it's. Oh. The, the end of the eight hours, it was about this big and still a part of the room. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Of all the things you didn't probably want to experience in your life. Right? Some humor on it, yes. <laughs> and that's it. You kind of have to laugh about it too. I mean, some of the some of the conversations you get into and some of the experiences. <coughs> I, I just wanted to say, uh, in defense of my dick doc, yeah. he, he, he did, uh, we, we asked him specifically about sort of sex, and he said, yeah. but, and, and my nerves are, are gone, so, mm -hmm. um, but we wanted to maintain intimacy, and so he said, well, jump in the bathtub together, just lather up and have a good time. <laughs> and so we don't really have a bathtub that's suitable for that, but in the shower, and, and, and there's, there's love that comes through cutting the firewood or preparing good meals, there's that kind of love, yeah. not particularly ex uh, exciting. 
then there's the love that's kind of the surprise and the kind of fun. And while I jumped in the shower with my wife, she didn't. She didn't know that I was coming. <laughs> she was in the shower. I, was, I knew she was going to have a shower. I, I got ready in the bedroom just to side, and I zipped into the shower. And we had a great soapy time there. <laughs> so that was on the doctor's advice. We didn't know. That's that. awesome. Yeah, that's really gross. And that's, you, you know, you brought up a really good point there. And it's something I didn't include in this talk was the intimacy part of it, right? And how important that is. And, you know, whether it's the surprise, you know, excursion or whatever it might be, but that's that's a huge part of this too. It's not just the physical; it's also the emotional, and you know, having having the ability to talk about these, you know, these fun little adventures you go on. <laughs> well, the so, biggest sex organ is still the brain. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And that's thanks for that segue, Alan, because that you know. We're getting towards the end of the list here as far as what the options are. And, you know, we talk about different braces and, and prosthetics. Um, pro I didn't have a suitable picture here for a prosthetic. Um, but it, it's that idea that the brain is the biggest sex organ. And even if you are not the one um, fully engaged in, in sex, it can still be really pleasurable. So um, it's always worth being open-minded and, you know, look at all the options and rediscover, re, you know, change the boundaries of your sex life. Um, one of the last uh, options for erectile function is the penile implant, and that is the surgical procedure, so you wouldn't want to go that route unless you had tried everything else and, you know, just been so frustrated or, or realized that nothing else is working. Um, the implant is a surgical procedure, and what's happening there is, uh, can you hear me at the back still, come yeah. over here? There's this reservoir up in the abdomen, and basically the on-off switch in the testicles. And the, the erectile bodies have been removed, and now there's this, this tube um, that fills with fluid from the reservoir when you turn it on. So it can be really effective. Basically, you have you know the final say of when you want to have an erection. You get to turn it on and turn it off. You don't have to go to the emergency room. So that you know it's it seems pretty far out there, but uh, there are a fair amount of fellas who have really good success with this, and it's definitely an option and a surefire option. So. So there you have it, all the options that I am aware of. Um, there may be more out there. I know that there are more medications coming down the tubes. Uh, there's some available, <laughs> <Sorry>. in, <laughs> some available in the US. Split so. the board. <laughs> so we'll, we'll stay tuned for you know all the, the latest ingredients. Yes. Is, it, is there a crit critical level of testosterone that uh, before you can get an erection? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, obviously more testosterone is, is better, I mean, yeah. isolated. And, yeah. yeah, I guess, yeah, I don't know the answer. Okay. I think if it's within normal range, you know, as far as what, what a blood work exam would tell you, then you likely have enough for erectile function. Um, and I guess it depends as well how often that testosterone is being called upon too. If if you know a daily erection is the goal, you might run out of testosterone potentially. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I can look into that for you. Okay. Yeah. Where's testosterone produced? It is produced in the testicles, but the brain, the hypothalamus gland, and the pituitary are basically they're they're filtering the blood, screening the blood to maintain uh, normal uh, normal levels. So if levels drop, then the brain basically tells the testicles to, to start producing. And if they're too high, then it says shut it down. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So this whole erectile <coughs> dysfunction story is not necessarily cause to go out and buy a Ferrari and you know totally avoid the subject and say, no, I'm not gonna deal with it. I'm gonna drive my Ferrari instead. It could be an opportunity to redesign your whole sex life. 
And with that comes this flexibility to, you know, try out some new tools and see if anything works for you. You know, surprise someone in the shower with a bunch of soap. Um, and communicate. And I think that's the biggest biggest part of it is is communicating you know what's going on for you what you need what you'd like to try um, and just being open with it and communicating with your healthcare team too that's that's also important uh, I've got this little video if it works I hope it works and he kind of um, he kind of covers all the points uh, that we talked about tonight but he's, he's a guy from the UK and has gone through this whole process himself can you guys hear that? Not at all. I had surgery on Tuesday and they they sent me out on Friday. The hearing goes when the erection goes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to continue, or should we just? No, that's good. Connie, there's volume two on the bottom. So you break by the number two. See if you can do that up a little bit. Too. Oh, your function desire doesn't. So it did lead me to want to find possible solutions to that. If I'm honest, it wasn't plain sailing. I tried the needles, uh, I didn't find them successful, you know, because there's a lot to do, a lot to think about, and then having done that, if they're going to wait for it to work. Um, so uh, I went back to the hospital, because they recommended that you try a vacuum pump. Um, so I arranged an appointment, got that one fitted, and very simple, put it on, you, you apply the vacuum, the vacuum that gives you erection, there's, another, there's a proper band that you have on the machine, and then screws over your penis which then maintains the erection for 20, 30 minutes. You know, there are a number of solutions to whatever it is, incontinence or erectile dysfunction. And like in all these things, if one doesn't work, keep moving on, you know, keep trying it. And you never know, if you come back to one of those, you might find that works. Of course, the erectile dysfunction did make me, it does make you think about you know, who you are as a man, you know, your manliness about it, but to be honest, it wasn't something, it didn't affect me very much, it was only a passing passing because I'd felt very secure in my sexuality beforehand. Um, it had never happened to me before. And my wife was very supportive on that, it, yeah, but it wasn't my fault. There was no blame there, there was no issue there, there wasn't something I wasn't doing or was doing. It's staying positive throughout all of this, that even if, in my case, even though I still have erectile dysfunction, I have adapted my life in such a way, and, and that's the way to do it, you adapt. And then you, once you've adapted, you then make that adaption as good as possible. I think one of the benefits in terms of uh, my relationship with my wife is it makes has made me more sensitive. And that isn't that isn't about sex or anything like that. It's actually about um, trying to value her more. I'm not saying I'm very good at it, but I, I do. It has made me more aware that that's really you can't simply sex out from every other aspect of your life. It's all intertwined. That's a really good website if you're looking for uh, different information or, or tools. It's not necessary, necessarily so applicable to Canadians, but it's um, got a lot of really good information. So your homework from this talk tonight is to be flexible. It's not so easy all the time. Um, to challenge yourself. Um, that might be, you know, creating that rehab plan or, you know, trying trying some things you haven't considered before, you know, um, challenging yourself to talking to your urologist about this. It's not always that easy, but I think, you know, once you once you open up that door, um, most healthcare practitioners would be happy to, to have a conversation with you about it. And then communicate. Communicate your needs. Um, you know, if you're in a partnered relationship or not, uh, it's all about 
having those conversations and and uh, um, checking in with each other once in a while. So that's all I've got for you tonight. Any questions? Anyone wants to put their truck in the air? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Some more stories too. Well, share away. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much.